in your time for this panel. Um, so I know that I and Deborah were here totally feel excited uh, to learn more about your career paths. Uh, so I'd like to take a quick round for everyone to introduce themselves, uh, so to share your um, main area of expertise and uh, one quirky thing about yourself. So I can start. That's always a weird last <laughs> request. So I'm Camille Vestruz. Um, my uh, research interests are focused around simulations of our universe and how to observations of objects like galaxies and galaxy clusters. One quirk about me is that I am a mosquito magnet, so whenever I get time to other folks, the mosquitoes skip over everyone else and come straight to me. Um, can we go in like a far to near order? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Rachel Niemer. Uh, my area of expertise is largely equity in higher education, and in particular in STEM higher education. And one quirky thing about me is I'm addicted to romance novels, and I've read over 270 of them so far this year. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this year. <laughs> it's year. It's amazing. I've read that in my life. <laughs> uh, so I'm Lisa Massaros. Um, and so I think I was invited today because I did get my PhD from the University of Michigan in aerospace engineering and computational science uh, many years ago. I left the research world after getting my PhD. I've spent my whole career on the commercial side. Um, so I work for Siemens Digital Industry Software. Uh, we have a whole portfolio of uh, physics modeling tools um, that industry uses quite um, readily. Um, I'm not sure this is quirky, but uh, today is actually my birthday. I'm Liz Livingston, a PhD student in mechanical engineering and computational science here. And my research interests are in data-driven modeling of biological systems. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, quirky thing about me, I played the tuba for most of my life up until college. Hi, uh, Katrin Heitmann, you just heard about um, what I'm interested in my research life. A quirky thing, I could point out the same thing that you have. Um, so when I was a little kid, I shared the bedroom with my sister and the mosquitoes didn't eat me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. um, another one, I like climbing, so it's something else that I share with you. Um, so that's not quirky, but that's something to take over. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, let's start off with our first question. Um, so if there was a time in your career or when you had to choose between two or more distinct paths. What were those choices? And how did you weigh out your decision? So um it was full option of industry versus staying in academia, different permanent position options and opportunity movement elsewhere, and any forks in your career that you think you want to share. Um who would like to start? Well, these decisions. So, uh, <laughs> earliest in my career. Uh, so the only decision I so have had to make really make really so far is the PhD decision, um, and it was basically between two institutions, two main advisors, and obviously I chose Michigan. Um, one of the reasons that I chose Michigan was because of the project opportunities here. It's a very collaborative environment. Um, and then I was uh, specifically planning to work with two advisors here, which was much more interesting to me, the connection to biology and biomedical engineering. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty much the only one. And I'm actively deciding with academia and industry and all that stuff. So I'm curious about your place. can go next. Um, so I think there were two things in my life. So the first one was coming to the U.S. And that one was... So I finished, or I was in the um, process of finishing my PhD, and in our field, you always have to apply a year in advance for a postdoc position. And I wasn't really sure if I wanted to a postdoc, what I wanted to do with my life in general. And so I applied for this. Um, I only applied for three positions, actually, and got one, which was the one in Los Alamos. And then my PhD finishing came closer, and, and actually I had to buy the flight ticket. And then somebody in my family said, do you have a suitcase you're going for like two or three years to the U.S.? And I said, like, no, I think I should buy some. And it was like two days before my flight. It was really not 
getting quite into my head that I would go to the US in a completely different country. It was a big step. Uh, my mother is not happy until the moment that I took that step. And the other one was really this move from Los Alamos um, to Argon. That was also a very big step um, because we took part of our research team over. And there it was a lot of different um, things that we thought about. Like one was um, New Mexico versus Chicago and different people have very different opinions about that. But one was also the science environment. So Los Alamos is great for um, overall for cross-disciplinary science. There are lots of opportunities. It has a great history. But the Chicago area also has um, excellent universities. You have the University of Chicago, you have Northwestern, you have Fermilab. Um, so, so, so the scientific opportunities in cosmology in particular seem to be better in the Chicago area. And um, so, so there were all these different things, um, like where do you want to live? Um, where can you do the best science? Where do you have the most support for this amazing so personal as well as, as um, scientific as well as okay. um, So I already alluded to, I guess, one of mine. Um, so when I was in the process of getting my PhD, I was uh, on a fellowship from the Department of Energy. Um, and one of their requirements was to spend time um, at a lab or something. And so I spent, I don't know, three or four months at a NASA facility uh, doing research into turbulence modeling methods. And I think that was um, when I started to look outside and in, in terms of, of maybe, you know, that kind of deep research wasn't what I was really passionate about. Um, I was much more interested in helping, you know, industry apply the technology um, that I've been investigating while I was in college. So, you know, I, I really immediately upon getting my PhD, like I said, went into the commercial world. One other thing I, that was a, a you know, a decision making point, I guess, in my life um, and, and maybe other uh, people face this is um, I decided to stop working for a few years uh, when my children were actually a little bit older. Um, they were in middle school, not when they were born. And I got advice from the people I was working with at the time, um, you know, sort of my managers and such that it would, it would be the end of my career. Um, and I decided to, to, to make that decision anyway. And I ended up taking four years off work and it did change my career path. Um, I had to get, back into work in different types of jobs than maybe what I was um, really passionate about, but found my way back to really exciting work. So I think there's not a straight path in a career. Um, and it's really just about making choices that work for you and know that doors will open um, if you're good and you work hard. So, um, so uh, probably the decision that comes to mind for me most is the whole reason I went to grad school to get my PhD was because I wanted to teach. Um, and it became very clear both in grad school and then again during my postdoc that I loved learning about chemistry and I hated actually doing it. And so figuring out this balance between how do I continue doing the thing that will, I think, get me to my end goal of teaching um, or do I give up on that? And, and so um, I finished the PhD and then actually taught for a year, realized I loved it so much, as much as I thought I would. So I did the postdoc and I I couldn't survive the postdoc. Like it was very clear that um, that continuing on the research path was not for me. Um, but I wanna emphasize what Lisa said is that um, doors do open. So I decided to take staff positions that were unlikely to lead to teaching opportunities. And I've now taught um, multiple graduate level courses, as well as I'm now teaching an undergraduate level course this semester and again next semester. And so taking care of yourself in the moment may be the absolute best choice and things do open up and you you can create opportunities even when you think doors were closed. Great, awesome. All right, uh, the next question we have is, um, can you share a memorable challenge in your career, how you overcame or navigated through that challenge, and a takeaway that you would like the audience to have from that experience? Logan Shuffle, Florida, China, Is 
So I'm in a big challenge right now. Um, so about five months ago, I took a different position at Siemens. Um, so I've always been uh, really out in the sales organization, working directly with companies, um, learning and, and how, how to apply and use our software to, to change their own businesses. And I got the opportunity to move on to the product side. Um, and now I'm leading the team that's really setting the product strategy for all the CAE tools. Um, and I've never done product management and I don't know what I'm doing, right? It's scary, <laughs> but I, I think the lesson is, is just to always look for opportunities to continue to challenge yourself, to step outside your box. I mean, that's where the really great stuff lies. Um, and I go to work every day, I'm learning something new, um, just taking one step forward, even though I don't know for sure where the end goal is. Um, the biggest challenge I probably faced um, was my mom died when I was in my, halfway through my fifth year, like into my sixth year of graduate school. Um, and the the thing that I want people to to keep in mind is it always feels huge in the moment, and you will get through it. You absolutely will. And um, it it feels hard, but just one foot in front of the other and keep going. I guess the biggest challenge so far has been that I got married during my PhD. Um, it's a little bit hard. I mean, COVID too, but everyone went through COVID. Um, but yeah, trying to balance, I guess, and learn to balance uh, the academic or PhD type of work as well as your personal life. Uh, and when you don't just do a courthouse wedding, you do a big thing. I did two weddings because my husband's Brazilian. So it was, it was a lot. Um, and then actively right now we want to start a family but that's kind of challenging when you're in the middle of trying to get your phd do you do a postdoc how do you do that um, and also be a woman who has to bear the child so uh, i guess um one challenge that i took upon myself was that i actually switched fields during my first postdoc so by training i was a article um, theorist and um, I decided during the time when I got my PhD, um, the next experiment and the next set of data was so far out in the future that um, it was not very exciting for me at the time. And at the same time, um, dark energy had just been discovered, um, the cosmological survey starting taking data. And um, I was at Los Alamos at that point, and I was told that um, if I want to do something, um, and supercomputing, computational cosmology would be an interesting path to go. So it was scary because for learning, I mean, learning something new is, is always scary, especially in, in a situation where you have a three-year postdoc, where after the three years you have to find the next um, step in your career. And um, so for, for this year where I switched, I didn't have any publications, but I had extremely good mentors who, who helped me to define problems that were relatively simple to really do push out some publications and get some stuff done. And also for me at the same time to learn the field of computational cosmology um, relatively rapidly. So so in the end it worked all out. It was scary at the time, um, but yeah, excellent mentors are always very important to, to help you also overcome these things where you start freaking out a little bit thinking, that, oh no, this will never work. Um, having somebody there who helps you through these things on where you think. Great, thanks, Megan. Awesome, yeah, during themes of like, like yeah, finding your support network, doing what's right for you in the moment, and yeah, one step in front of the other. Thank you. Okay, right, let's do one more of the set questions and we'll open up to some content from the audience and see if there's any of those. So for this one, um, on the flip side, can you share a memorable experience during career, during your career, either a distinct success or a fond memory? And what makes uh, that experience valuable to you? <laughs> I, showed, I showed one um, in the talk where we're really, um, 
we did work on this supercomputer on, on Roadrunner where the code was actually working on the full machine. It wasn't crashing. It took quite a few attempts to make it not to crash. Um, so, so that was really, really nice um, having this team that, that worked so hard on it and, and getting it actually done. So that was, that was really a very, very nice experience. <laughs> Um, so one of, one of the things I've enjoyed most in my career, and, and I've um, had the luxury of, of being able to, to manage teams of engineers, and really it's, it's helping um, people in their career progression, um, being able to align work for them or challenges for them to take on that really play to their skill set. Um, and, you know, when you see that you can get someone who's maybe, you know, a okay performer, you know, and, and find an opportunity for them to engage in some project or activity um, that, that really is to their strengths and then watch them thrive and be able to develop and grow their career. Um, I've just found that very rewarding. So I've, I've spent a lot of time hiring engineers out of college. Um, and helping them navigate and grow their careers. And it's been really rewarding for me. Um, I think uh, for me, the most memorable and rewarding moments have been being part of a team. So currently, like I said, I'm teaching. So the instructional team that I'm a part of, my team at WISE, like um, the best parts of science and of my career have been getting to know and work with other people. Um, it's rewarding to, to see people grow and um, to come together to create something. Uh, so I guess on two fronts, in terms of research, I guess the most rewarding experience was one particular moment when we were doing lots of forward simulations and spent a lot of time on trying to create highly accurate simulations and that didn't really feel like we were actually getting anywhere that would make an impact. Um, but then when we started looking at the inverse models, working with a good mentor and actually being able to have him come in after I had done a lot of mathematical work and came up with one of the main ideas that led to actually having some meaningful models. Um, and that felt really good, and we were rushing to get an abstract done, and I sketched out a figure, and I said, this is what the figure is going to look like, and my other advisor said, are you sure? And I said, the math says that's what the figure is going to look like, and so I put the abstract together with that figure hand-drawn, and then within a day was able to actually get that data, and it looked exactly like <laughs> I predicted. So it just is nice when it comes together that, like, the math works. It, it has to work. Uh, so that felt really good. And then along the same lines, in terms of teaching, um, it's really nice when uh, you see someone grow and see someone improve. Um, and once I spent some time outside of uh, class working with a student who was struggling uh, quite a bit, and they actually reached out to me after the class and thanked me with an email. And that's one of the best feelings I've ever had in teaching. So. Oh, a lot of really fulfilling stuff that everyone brought up. Thank you. Great. Are there questions from the Did any of you use the software SAS in your uh, work? No. Uh, another question is oh, no. I forgot it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. when are you going to or is one of the PhD another PhD candidate going to get involved with the vascular system as opposed to the uh, cartilage so, I mean, I'm still working on that project, but there are, there's a lot of different um, PhD um, candidates working in that group. And there's also another professor who works on heart modeling at Michigan as well. Um, so there's quite a few people working on the project. There's a lot of postdocs on um, my particular problem. Um, but yeah, 
there there will be people that come in and, and take over the project more. Yeah. I, yeah, I have a question related to like professional development activities. So what would be something that you would recommend to people that are at the beginning of their research career? professional development. Yeah, so what would you recommend uh, starting early in their career professional development? Um, the thing, this probably won't come as a surprise, take as many math classes as you can. If you're going to be a scientist, take as much math as you can as an undergraduate. It's only going to help you in the future. Yeah, I'm not sure what classes there are, but, you know, the whole soft skill side of being successful in anything that you do in terms of how you communicate, how you collaborate. Um, I think sometimes in engineering and science, the importance of that can be forgotten. But it's, it's critically, it's been critically important in my career and I think it is probably in navigating most careers. I think it's um, also very important to find something that you're really, really passionate about um, because sometimes science can get hard and if you're passionate about it, you just know that you will you will work through it and you will find ways and, and means to, to actually solve the problem and then you have these great moments where you see actually math works. <laughs> so, um, so, but, but I think it's, it is very important that you're passionate about it because if you're only doing it because it's, it's a job kind of thing, then, then it will be difficult to actually. Make it. Yeah. Um, right. I have two questions. One I already touched upon when uh, you were speaking. Uh, maybe this is more for Catherine because you've been in a, you grew up in a different country. Um, so what do you see are the different challenges faced by if you had been in Germany and had a similar career path compared to a career path here or people like you here? So is, is there any fundamental differences? I could give you a rather personal answer to that. So, so I actually, um, grew up as, um, one of three children. Um, this is a single mom because my dad passed away very, very early when I was six. And I think the German system is just excellent in providing exceptional education for everybody without cost, yeah. um, especially if you don't have the background, right? I mean, if you come from a rich family, you pay something for the university. But I got to high school, right? It was free. There was no private schools. Um, the university, um, physics was completely free and easy. I, I really just went to campus and signed up for physics. Um, so, so the educational system in Germany really provided me so much opportunity, which I believe if I would have grown up in the US under the same circumstances would have been much, much, much harder, um, even though there are fellowships, but um, it, it just is different. Um, so I think that was really very important for me. Um, and, and that's independent of blockchain or anything. But, but having a supportive um, educational system that really puts up opportunities independent of your background is, is so important. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll come back with more questions. So uh, all of you are successful women. Are there things that you feel could have been different systemically in in you know either in the education system, the academic system, the work system that you would that would have helped make life better that you've either seen implemented or you feel is still not you know we are still far away from doing, making those implementations. <laughs> it's a big, big question. I mean, I think everyone is 
discussed it. I, I spent my whole career working with men, right? I most meetings, I'm the only female in the meeting. Um, the the hardest part, and and I I I don't know if um, I've been lucky, but I've always felt like my ideas have been heard, right? Um, I never felt, um, you know, except for point situations, there are always certain people, right? But overall, you know, I felt like my companies valued the work that I was doing, listened to my ideas, treated me equal. The hard part sometimes for me is from a social perspective. When we talk about the importance of teamwork and being part of a team, um, just the camaraderie, my friendships at work are all with men. Um, and sometimes they like to talk about different things than I want to talk about. So, and you conform to that. So if, if we could find a way to get more diversity so that you could have those relationships, which create a f more fulfilling work environment, which would attract more women, it kind of plays on itself. And I wonder sometimes if it's just that, um, that's what turn some girls away at some point along the path um, when they start to, to feel isolated. Um, so one place where I've seen things improve um, is, but, so I had my two kids five and a half years apart and the experience in higher education of um, having a kid taking time off and then, you know, I chose to breastfeed and the entire experience evolved and got so much better between the first kid and the second kid. And, and it, I found it astonishing um, how different it was. They were at two different institutions, but on paper, those two institutions had identical policies. And so um, uh, time, I think, played a big part in that. Um, the One of the things that still irks me, I guess, um, uh, pay transparency is wonderful at University of Michigan, except when you realize that the women on the leadership team are paying, getting paid less than the men on the leadership team. And you can call attention to it, but more often than not, there's some legitimate reason why that pay differential exists. Um, and uh, as the university espouses how important equity is, um, there's that pay differential, but also I had to take a pay cut to do DEI work. So my move from my last office having a higher level position where I'm running a unit, I took a 25K pay cut. So it, those are my reflections. I think in all I can really speak to is PhD experience, but uh, I think it would be nice if the universities, and this is kind of based on the department that you're in, but it'd be nice if there was a little bit more um, reflection that they looked at from PhD students on the advising relationship, the mentoring relationship. If there are any issues with your advisor, it's nice to have a discreet way to tell the university about it. We have to go through all these sexual harassment seminars and everything, but we're never really told that maybe you could go to the dean or to the ombudsman if you're having issues in mentorship during your PhD. Um, and one of the reasons I originally picked Michigan, I don't have issues with my advisors. Yeah. One of the reasons that I picked Michigan <laughs> is because there's a gigantic department. So if you have an issue with your advisor, there's likely someone who does something in your field and you could potentially shift advisors. It's supposed to be independent research. So I think it'd just be nice if maybe Rackham as a whole kind of had requirements on these sort of check-ins. And also in terms of PhD progress in mechanical engineering, there are technically things that you have to do along the way, but no one really checks in on you. So it'd be nice if there was a little bit more um, oversight on the PhD process.
a good one. Um, I am interested in like, like a similar topic of relationships and just teaching in general. I feel like um, I've had a very positive experience, but then I've also faced situations where, you know, people have like, walked out in my classrooms while I'm still talking and they would you know they would come to like office hours or uh you know like a math lab or something like that I'm in the math department and they would ask you questions but then they would talk over you and like similar situations like this and uh, obviously I can't speak to everybody's experience but I also feel that you know a significant part of this is them not taking me seriously um <laughs> and um so I was just curious if you have faced similar situations in, you know, maybe working in a team or teaching and how do you deal with that? Um, yeah. <laughs> I have something to say about everything apparently. Um, uh, so, one of the things that I still find it very challenging to do, I've absolutely experienced it, um, is uh, figuring out the way to um, assert oneself while still feeling comfortable, right? Like I am as conflict avoidant as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things that um, I, I realized over time is it takes practice that stopping and saying you asked a question can I have a minute to answer it before you know and you can be polite but actually being direct and and straightforward and it, it's not a calling them out but a, a recognition of what's happening in the moment um the uh walking out when you're talking in class um that almost has absolutely nothing to do with you and it is about what where they are in their headspace or their physical space and that's the other thing is to try to remember that it often feels very much about you and most of the time no one else is thinking about you it's both comforting and disheartening that nobody actually cares that much about you as much as you think that they do um Lessons that took me a long time to learn. I, I don't have anything more to add. I think I haven't, I was trying to think about this sometimes because I haven't noticed it that much. I mean, there, there are people who just like to talk a lot, right? And you learn that there are certain individuals who always have to say something and that's okay. It, it doesn't mean that I also have to say something, right? Um, but I think it, it's about learning how to to be maybe more direct. And I think maybe to my benefit, I'm a pretty direct person by personality wise. And maybe that's why I've been able to navigate those situations a little more easily. But, um, but it's also okay just to let them say the things they think they need to say. and You don't have to respond. I think just one small thing, everything they said is obviously true and accurate. Um, with students, you also, in order to like build rapport with them, I, if it wasn't clear, I'm a rather like open book. Um, and I also treat my students that way in terms of the teaching process. So I put a lot of effort behind the scenes into teaching when I do teach. Um, and I want students to know that because they can have these frustrations and they might air that in office hours. They might air that in lecture in your student reviews, where women are typically reviewed differently than men. But if you're more open and honest with them about the process, I'm also a student, I'm struggling to like balance all of this. I think it can help sort of provide some context for them um, and prevent some of those sticky situations. He was going a little while longer. Um, I, I don't know if I need that, but uh, yeah. 
So it, you know, as was been mentioned already, I mean, it's great to have a, a group of successful uh, female scientists here. And one thing that, Rachel, you didn't mention in terms of whys was the role model issue. And so I'm curious about you, your experience regarding having some sort of you know, senior woman in your lives at a certain critical point and whether, you know, was that important for you or was it not? Because, you know, maybe, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm just curious. Um, so I think I had a handful of, of important senior people in my life who actually helped go in the right direction, encouraged to take risks, um, telling me, yes, you can do this when I walked in and, and they were extremely, they were extremely open to the mentoring process. Like I walked one day in somebody's office and I said, I think I'm too young to do that. And he said, well, you are older than, you can be the president of the United States if you wouldn't be German. So, <laughs> so you are clearly old enough to, to lead this project, right? And, and um, I'm often thinking about that. Like, so having these people who just, you can, um, you can talk to and who can give you advice and um, not just technical advice, but in general, like when you say like, can I really do this? And, and they talk you through and, and it was not just that he gave me this like, um, generic advice, but but talk you through why they think you can do this. Um, I thought for me that was very very important. The role model thing it's it's a very interesting question. Um, so all my mentors and supervisors and people in my life were all male. Um, so there was no, and that's in part because of the field, right? Um, interestingly enough, at our group um, in our cosmology group, the core cosmology group at Argon has currently seven staff members and five are female and two are male. And um, we also have quite a few female postdocs and students. And at some point I asked them like, how did you make this decision to come to Argon? Did it actually um, change your, like your decision-making process that there was already a group with quite a few women there? And, and they said, yes, it was very important for them that they felt like they had the decision to make between uh, just male group and, and this mixed group of um, quite a few women in that group. And they said like it made them feel much more comfortable that they didn't have this always like, yes, I have to prove myself in this male group. So, so I think it is very important and we have to work harder on that. I think it's also nice if you have peers who are similar to this group. Um, it, it just helps when you want to talk to someone. I chose to work with two men instead of a woman for my PhD. So I don't know if I can really speak to that. Um, but my my master's mentor was a woman. Um, and I do think I actually ran into her at a conference this summer and I was able to talk to her again. And with where I am in my life, it was really nice to talk to a woman who understood these issues. Um, my, my male mentors can try, but they can't, they simply can't understand the types of um, difficulties that we go through. Um, so I think it, it is important. Um, although, again, having supportive male mentors is also just as, as valuable, I think. Yeah, well, all of my, you know, professional mentors have been male, same situation. There's um, what what I have, and, that, and there's been great ones, like you said. Um, um, Phil Rowe, who was my advisor at Michigan, you know, taught me to become comfortable being uncomfortable right i mean he, he, he taught me a lot of life lessons the thing i'm trying to do um is there are more you know young females joining siemens um so trying to set up networks and I, i'm trying to be that role model i guess um create communities to pull them together because they do work in you know, diverse parts of the company, they might feel like an island, but there's actually, you know, um, a growing number. And so trying to create coffee hours or opportunities to find a side project or ways to get them to be able to interact, to feel part of that community, um, hopefully is, is making a difference. Yeah. I think for me, also all my all of my research advisors from undergrad through postdoc were male. Um, for me, 
I enjoyed being one of a few women in my grad cohort because I was ambitious and I wanted to stand out, right? Like it, it was motivating to me, not demotivating, but I think it really depends on the person. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is the science gets better when there's more diversity and the experience of people who are underrepresented gets better the less underrepresented they are. Um, and so I think having role models is important and it might be about your personal social circumstances. It might be about your science. Um, we all need, the research says that we need, actually need mentor networks, not a mentor and um, figuring out what you need mentorship in and finding the right person, I think is more important than who or what identities that person holds. That being said, I still want to see way more women in science. <laughs> okay, so um, at least in my opinion, the last 15 years or so, or maybe 10 years or so, most organizations like the University of Michigan corporate there's been a big push towards improving DEI, right? In, in various ways. And um, I feel some gains have been made, um, but certainly certain things are just to check boxes, right? We, we'll, we'll say there are some good, some bad. Um, would you agree that, I mean, what's your take? How, how, do you think, we? I mean, there. I also give it that a lot more has to be done, right? So no excuses for where we are. But uh, if you take just the last few years, do you feel things are still moving in the right direction? Or maybe we picked some low hanging fruit, right? Maybe we address some, not. let's not do this stupid thing, right? <laughs> and we've cut that out, right? So I just want to hear, hear your opinion on what is working well, what we can do better, and what is the new set of challenges that, you know, come across in the DEI space. A few questions there, but you get what I mean. Um, I think you're right that we picked the low hanging fruit, um, but it's better that we picked it than it fell to the ground and rotted. Um, uh, so I think, um, a challenge in the DEI space um, is just geographically where a given institution is located, right? In so many ways, Michigan, University of Michigan is in much better shape than if we were in Florida or Texas, um, where my job would probably be cut. No, it will not exist. Well, it, it, it existed for a little while, but yes, awesome. it, it would not exist anymore. Um, uh, and yet Michigan also was one of the first states to pass a ban on affirmative action um, in higher ed admissions, which has really um, put a stranglehold on the kinds of changes that, that can be made. Um, and so I think the, the key challenge or a key challenge from here on out is that the work can't just be done in a department at an institution. It also, there has to be more advocacy around equity issues in the state and federal government, certainly globally. Um, and that, uh, and beyond that, we also, one of the reasons why I made sure to show University of Michigan data is um, if you actually ask people about equity issues, uh, they say, oh, these issues are very important, but it's not a problem in my neighborhood or it's not a problem here. Um, there's a recent study um, that came out that I can never remember the whole title, but it starts with basically how well-intentioned white male physicists basically perpetuate their power differential unintentionally, um, but by believing that the issue isn't there and that they can't make a difference. Um, and so, a, a couple of reflections are, we've got to be thinking that change beyond the institution to be able to create change within the institution. And um, really 
beyond that, making it hyper-local so people realize that it's something that we need to deal with here. I think there's clearly, uh, this kind of just getting back to the Rackham or Michigan at the institutional level doing something to check in on students. Because if you look at the data, I haven't looked at this for a long time, I'm sure you know all about it, but the, uh, I forget the word, for the number of PhD students who start versus the number of PhD students who finish for underrepresented minorities at Michigan is pretty bad. So obviously like with the affirmative action change, the number of students who started also changed quite a bit. But then I think what matters even more than the number of people who start is the number of people who finish in that degree program. And there are quite a few who do not finish. Um, and I know this from the statistics and also from anecdotal personal experience where students just, again, because the either the department didn't check in on them, they didn't uh, fully understand the expectations and they ended up mastering out of their PhD program. Um, and not necessarily because they were more interested in industry or they decided to do a different career path, but because the, the process failed. Um, so I think, yeah, just checking in on, on students and, and making sure that the students who are accepted actually succeed and get their PhD. All right, I think we're past the top three hours, so thank you all, and let's uh, thank our wonderful panelists for this.